after the intense presentation. I mean, uh, Rohini already set a pretty high standard, so I have to really work hard to beat that. So I thought I'll start off by showing you a movie, right? And the movie is about high frequency trading. Right? Isn't that exciting? Um, so as, as every movie has some background, my movie also has some background, and the background is about how the trading used to happen in, 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 I don't know, the distant era. It was pretty manually sort of organized where um, if I want to trade, I go to the floor, trading floor and um, sort of meet with the broker and it's a lot of manual trading. Um, that obviously led to a lot of inconsistencies, right? I mean, there are lots of errors in, in, in sort of order placement and so forth. And price discovery process was very difficult in that era and obviously technology has evolved to such a um, high level that now all of these impressions have already gone. And um, that's exactly where my paper come in. Like, well, now the technology has improved to such a level that the trading is happening at 250 microseconds. I mean, that's huge. That's, so one microsecond is one millionth of a second. So we are trading at every 250 microseconds. Okay? So obviously, I mean, you can see that um, there's a sumo wrestler. So my paper is on Tokyo stock market. Tokyo stock market was sort of lagging behind until 2010 because their speed of trading was pretty slow. They were, they were trading at the rate of six seconds. So order placement um, time used, used to be six seconds. In 2010, what they did is they did a system overhaul where they reduced the latency to three milliseconds. Now, they did that to sort of uh, keep up with the competition. I mean, New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ and London Stock Exchange, they were already uh, ahead in, in this game. And so they, they're trying to attract these high frequency traders to their platform um, to sort of keep up with the increased competition. Not only uh, internationally, but also within the, uh, Tokyo, within the Japanese market, there were like ECNs that were uh, launched and they were sort of offering this kind of service. So in order to avoid any kind of competition, they sort of said, well, we'll sort, sort of go ahead and, and upgrade our system. And this is joint work, as uh, Professor Pankaj Jain sort of pointed out, with Dr. Pankaj Jain and Dr. McInish um, from Memphis. So again, as I already um, sort of told you about the event, so on January 4, 2010, Tokyo Stock Exchange launched this new trading platform, which increased the speed of trading by about 2,000 time, 2, times. This number is slightly wrong here, but uh, from six seconds, it reduced the latency to three milliseconds. Okay, so this is a drastic reduction. In the US market, um, this high frequency trading, the latency reduction was in steps, not really a drastic change. So over here, it's a significant change. Now, the, the outcome of that change was high frequency trading increased from 0% because it cannot exist in, in six second trading environment to almost 36% in, in about two years. So about more than one third of the volume is being executed by high frequency traders right now. Okay. So the goal of my paper is to sort of look at how does latency affect market quality. Okay. Um, so I, I measure market qualities using several parameters, which I will get onto later, but let me give you some institutional details. How Tokyo Stock Exchange is different than other, other stock markets and so that you may be careful in using or generalizing these results. Obviously, Tokyo market is uh, the largest uh, stock exchange headquartered outside the US, and it's, I guess, third in the entire world based on market cap. Okay. Uh, in addition to that, um, there's a lot of things going on right now. For example, New York Stock Exchange, Euronext, have an agreement with Tokyo Stock Exchange. They are going to combine their um, uh, networks together. So the trader who has an account on one of the exchanges can trade in both exchanges simultaneously. Another thing that's happening that's new right now is the universal trading platform. Um, earlier this year, New York Stock Exchange stocks started moving to this UTP. So UTP is going to combine several stock exchanges together. So again, there is creating one platform where a trader having access to that platform will be able to trade in all of the exchanges. Again, this is to sort of facilitate um, some form of high frequency or algorithmic based trading. Um, Tokyo Stock Exchange is a purely electronic market, order-driven market. There are no market makers. Uh, they have two trading sessions. They have a pretty long lunch break from 11 to 12.30 p.m. Uh, there's no upstairs market, so there are no hidden orders. Whatever you see in the limit our book is what's the true liquidity. So this is actually an ideal setting to test some of the th theories that have been put forward by um, researchers on high-frequency trading. 
Uh, another unique feature of Tokyo market is they have varying tick sizes and minimum trading units that vary based on prices. Interesting uh, aspect of Tokyo market is not fragmented at all. Now the fragmentation is completely gone because initially, during my study period, there, there were two stock exchanges in, in, in Japan, Tokyo and Osaka. They merged earlier this year, so there's only one exchange left in, 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 in Jap Japanese market. Even during my study period, almost 91% of the volume was being executed by the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Uh, there have been several studies that have been uh, conducted on the Tokyo market that have analyzed several of the unique features in the pre-arrowhead uh, environment or pre hyper concentrating environment. So my goal is to see like, how things have changed after the launch of this new platform. Okay. Now again, there have been a lot, lot of work done on high frequency trading on the US market and some of the European markets. Again, I'm trying to summarize some of the literature. By no means it's all of them, but I try to do my best to cover uh, the major papers. For example, there is a theory paper by Folk, Holt, Roll, and Sanders in 2003 uh, they sort of argue that, well, the launch of, uh, or, or the introduction of high-frequency trading or reduce, reducing the speed of trading may sort of increase the cost of trading. Okay. They argue that, well, if, if you trade at a faster pace, then uh, the informed trader can quickly take advantage of some kind of stale information. Okay. And hence, that should increase the information asymmetry in the market, which should result in increase in cost of trading. On the other hand, uh, recent papers like Rosso 2009, Bohemers and Yote uh, 2005, they argue that, well, the high-frequency trading, the introduction of high-frequency trading basically is good for the market because it increases the competition among the traders. So due to the increased competition, it should reduce the cost of trading because they're pl uh, placing orders at, at very close prices. Okay. And because of, of this uh, sort of uh, debate in, in, in the market about the liquidity, there's debate about volatility as well. So people, again, I mean, there are researchers like Henry Shaw, Jones, and Mankwell, that's the Journal of Finance 2011 paper. They sort of basically argue that, well, since um, high frequency trading increased the cost of immediate trading, that should result in increased volatility, okay? Versus, again, the other side is taken by Brogard, Hesbrook, Hesbrook and Sard. They argue that, well, over the uh, short period of time, high frequency trading is good for the market because it should reduce the uh, volatility due to increased competition again. Okay. Now, um, that has already been done, so the, the role of my paper and most important contribution that we make in this paper is to look at the risk measures. So how does high frequency trading affect the risk in the market? Okay. We measure risk uh, along three, these three broad parameters. First is systemic risk. So we use a new measure proposed by Adrian and Brynmer Bryn in 2011. It's a working paper, but very highly cited. Uh, they propose this new measure, COR, which is basically looking at the contribution of, um, by, uh, to the systemic risk by any ins institution. So they look at the financial institution, and we sort of modify this, this measure to make it applicable to the stock market. Okay. Then the uh, next set of risk measures we look at is the shock, shock propagation risk. How quickly the shock that has been uh, sort of created in one of the stocks spills over to other stocks and also goes into spiral within the same stock. So to do that, we look at autocorrelation in order flow and cross-correlation order flow. Again, there's no literature that sort of guides us uh, in this aspect, because there's no literature that sort of tells us how, what should be the effect of high-frequency trading on the risk. So we go back to the literature on liquidity to sort of give us some direction here. So for example, parlors sort of argue that, well, if the markets are very liquid, which we assume that increase in high frequency trading should increase liquidity as well. So if the markets are liquid, then what happens is it's easy for me to earn the spread. And so if I buy, and then it's easy for me to take the other side and, and quickly sell. So hence the autocorrelation in my order flow should be negative. Versus um, BA Hill and SPAD sort of uh, think about it from the stealth trading perspective. If the markets are, are very liquid, then uh, it's easier for me to break down my big orders if I'm an informed trader. Instead of trading a big, large sizes, I would break my order into several small sizes, and that should increase the autocorrelation. So again, there's a debate about that, too. Uh, Cross-correlation also uh, has been debated. Again, higher liquidity may make it easier to trade bundles. So for example, if the markets are liquid, and if there's information about Apple, it's easier for me to trade both Apple and Microsoft together in a bundle. 
or even Cisco in, in, as a bundle. That's what's being argued here in this paper. But Baker uh, argues that, well, if the markets are liquid, then there's more stock-specific information that's being generated. If there's more stock-specific information that's coming to the market, that should reduce autocorrelation because now the stock is moving on its own, not really moving together with the market. So that should reduce the uh, cross-correlation. Something new about high-frequency trading um, has been recently discussed in several papers, and these are, again, not all of them, but there are several other papers that talk about code stuffing. So basically what's going on is like these computers, when they're trying to compete with each other for existing liquidity, so if there's an order that they, both of these computers are trying to compete, the way they, they uh, keep, try to keep themselves ahead of, of this competition is to slow other computers down. And the way that they do that is they, they put in a lot of fake orders, which is like so they're trying to stuff the, the limit order book by summiting in uh, a large number of fake orders, which they pull right after their order is being executed. Not only that, there could be some price manipulation also going on, which I, I mean, again, don't quote me on that, but what I feel is like um, maybe if, if there's a computer that's trying to buy, they put in a lot of sell orders, and, and that triggers sort of similar sort of algorithm because the, uh, it's high frequency trading is based on algorithmic trading. They, they get this new order flow, which is sort of one computer is trying to sell, that may trigger the selling pressure from the other computers and, and sort of uh, reduce the price and make the price more favorable to buy, which, which may be the goal of the high frequency traders. Right? So again, there could be something of that going on. And people have used several measures to capture code stuffing. For example, hash groups are 2013, they use runs in process, basically number of messages being posted by the trader. So basically looking at the number of quotes overall, like number of quote revisions, number of cancellations, number of new quotes coming in and so forth. The sum of all of those becomes their quote stuffing measure in some sense. Okay. The same idea here, Henderson, Jones, and Mankel look at message traffic. Okay. We argue that, well, just looking at quotes may not be enough because if the quotes are being converted to trades, that's a good thing. I mean, if quotes goes up and trades goes up, that's, that's okay, because that's what we want, right? Um, so we look at quotes to trade ratio. So how many quotes are being posted for every single trade? We also do some uh, analysis on um, how does um, high frequency, like so after the launch of high frequency trading, how does uh, liquidity affect the price predictions. So basically, uh, Harris and uh, you, you, Punchification have a paper in um, Journal of Financial Market in 2005, I guess. They sort of saw that based on the limit order book information, we can forecast the price movement uh, in, in future. Okay? And so, um, again, this result is taken out of the paper because it has already been done. But basically, we show that in, in high frequency trading environment, that predictive power of the limit order book has increased. So basically, based on the past limit order book data or information, I can predict more pre precisely if the price is going to go up or down. And finally, what we do is we, look, we test Russell's theory of attrition. Basically, there's a game that the traders play. Um, there may be impatient traders in the market who try to improve the limit order book, and there are high frequency traders who are hiding. They're not posting their, their intent to trade on the limit order book, but as soon as they see the improved quotes, they jump in and sort of trade. Those are called fleeting orders, and I'll, I'll go in more details when I get to that result. But that has, we test if, if high frequency trading affect that, uh, the number of fleeting orders being posted in the market. All right, before I move forward, let me convince you. So in this paper, what we do, is how, what we do differently than the existing literature on high frequency trading is we use the pure limit order book data, the complete limit order book data. Um, so far, the papers have just looked at the top of the limit order book, most, most of them. And if I show you these quotes and I ask you which stock is more liquid, stock one or two, and based on this data and the tools that we have right now, we can use either bid or spread, which is the same for these two stocks, right? We can use DAP or we can use volume, the trading data. But for these two stocks, it's all the same. So the broad conclusion that can be drawn is both stocks are equally liquid. Now if I show you the entire limit order book, let's assume the limit order book has only five steps, and ask you the same question, which stock is more liquid? Now this answer may not be so straightforward, right? We don't have enough tools to sort of analyze this kind of um, um, data. 
So what we do is we ask a different question, like, well, how about if I want to buy 1% of the average, 0.1% of the average daily, daily trading volume, how much will it cost me to buy that much volume? So in this case, how much will it cost me to trade 1,000 stock? For stock one, it's going to walk up um, all five steps, all right? So 200 will be executed at 21 and, and so forth, walk down the, the linear book. In this case, walk up because trying to sell, let's say. Um, or here, if I want to buy stock two, then I only have to walk up two steps. So 200 will be executed at 21, and then rest, 800 will be executed at 22. So based on this, I can conclude that stock two is more liquid. Another way to look at it is like plotting these uh, volume elasticities. So what I do is I look at, well, how much additional volume is being supplied at every given price steps. And then I capture the slope of this curve. The steeper the slope, the higher is the liquidity. Okay. So those are the two measures that we use to capture the liquidity uh, of the pure limit R book, or, or the complete limit R book. Here are the formulas to calculate the same. In addition to, to using the entire limit R book data, we sort of align with the existing literature by using traditional measures top of the limit order book data, and also the trading data. Okay. Our data, um, we, we look at 150 stock exchange, uh, stocks that are traded on Tokyo Stock Exchange, um, 50 large cap, 50 mid cap, and 50 small cap stocks. The source is obviously in the NEETS database, which is the only provider of um, the Tokyo, well, obviously you can go to Circa, but NEETS database provides our data. It's a, it's a very, um, sort of a pure limit order book data, and the timestamp is closest to the millisecond. It has information about every single order, if it's a buy order or sell order, order type. Uh, it also has information on um, volume, what's the volume is being supplied every, uh, every step of the limit order book. And then to do intraday analysis, what we do is we aggregate the data in the one minute uh, buckets. Here are our initial results. So basically looking at the mean analysis, so uh, the first block here shows us the risk measures, how they have changed in the post-arrowhead environment. We do a pre-crisis benchmark, and then we do uh, pre-arrowhead and post-arrowhead measures of the same numbers. So for example, autocorrelation, and here are the uh, difference in the mean, sort of a simple t-test. We look at, uh, so overall, all the risk measures are increasing in the post-arrowhead environment. Okay. Or here, if looking at the market quality measures, the cost of immediate trading, so basically, um, how much does it cost me to trade right now? How much does it cost if I place a market order versus a limit order? Like, if I'm not being patient and I put a market order right now, that cost has significantly declined, which is a good thing. So the cost of immediate trading in the post-arrowhead environment has declined significantly. Um, slope, which is the inverse measure, which is a direct measure of liquidity, has increased. So this good, again, a good thing about high-frequency trading. And the same sort of conclusion can be drawn by looking at the top of the book or, or the trading data. Interesting observations, the number of trades have significantly increased, which is, I guess, uh, has been established in the literature that high-frequency traders are putting in more smaller trades, so they try to execute smaller orders. So, so the, that increases the number of trades, but it reduces the average trade size. So they are submitting smaller orders, and, oh, that's it, okay. Well, maybe I spent too much time on, um, Anyway, so let me show you the graph so that may explain uh, the story a little bit better. So here's the cost of immediate trading, and I plot the intraday sort of values for each of these variables, and you can see like a W shaped pattern because there's this uh, uh, lunch break in between. So we have a U shaped pattern established for the US market. For the Japanese market, we have a W shaped pattern because, again, there's a lunch break, and uh, things uh, are different at the start of each session and at the close of the session. Clearly, at the, after the arrowhead, cost of media trading has declined. Autocorrelation in order flow has increased significantly. So basically a buy order is being followed by another buy order is followed by another buy order and so forth. So the, um, again, if, if there's a sell order which, which could have triggered like a, a flash crash kind of a situation in a given stock. So for, for every given stock, if, if there are sell orders, they are being followed by continuous sell orders which can uh, move the price away from the fundamentals. Goals to trade ratio have increased significantly. So for every trade, there used to be about two quotes, but now there are about seven quotes. 
Other flow coax and coars, they have also increased. So this is the contribution of a stock uh, risk towards the systemic risk. So systemic risk has sing increased significantly. So the entire stock market is moving together as a system, not really, um, uh, stocks are not moving on their own. And um, here's the formal testing of the results that I've shown. So I'm going to skip and save some time. I'm just going to go to more interesting results. Again, cross-correlation have increased significantly in the post-arrowhead environment. So again, the, the system, as I said, the, the stock market is moving as a system. So if things go wrong in one of the stocks, like flash crash, if, if there are sell orders in a given stock, that triggers the sell orders across the board, and the market can be pulled down simultaneously at, 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 uh, or instantly. Similarly, uh, the coars, this is the formal testing. Again, I showed you the picture, but the, uh, in the regression analysis, we find the coefficient on arrowhead to be significant. So coar and covax have increased significantly. Again, these are the measures of systemic risk, how the market is moving as a system has increased significantly in the post-arrowhead environment. Here's the analysis for fleeting orders. So to better, a little bit better explain this, um, here's the limit order book. On bid side and sell um, ask side, they're pretty tightly placed, and the the trader here is getting impatient. He's not getting his order being executed. So he becomes impatient and improves the quote. As soon as he does that, this guy who's hiding and trying to, waiting for, for, for any quote improvement, quickly submits a sell order and, and the trade happens. So that's a fleeting order. So, so we try to see how many of these fleeting orders um, have, how the fleeting orders have evolved in the post arrowhead environment. And we see that a fleet, number of fleeting orders have increased significantly in the post uh, arrowhead environment. So basically the traders are not really posting their quotes um, in case the limit order book is pretty tight. They're hiding behind and, and as soon as um, uh, the, there's, there are quote improvements, they quickly trade. And here's again the formal testing. So all of those results are in the paper, but basically showing the regression analysis that fleeting orders have increased significantly in the post arrowhead environment. Now, people may argue, and we have been sort of uh, criticized on the fact that, well, what if it's a time trend? Okay. So what we do is we say, well, all right, if it's a time trend, then all the stocks on the, Tokyo, or on the Japanese market should be affected in the same, same manner. So we do a difference in difference analysis using Os Osaka stock exchange, our stocks as um, our control sample. And we show that our effects are only visible for Tokyo market, so they are significantly different. Finally, our final set of analysis, we look at the tail risk. We look at the extreme market conditions. We look at when the market is in fifth percentile, extreme negative uh, conditions, what happens in those situations. We see that all of our risk measures increase even at a higher pace um, in the extreme market condition, which could result in, in a situation like flash crash on the Tokyo market. And here is, again, the formal set of analysis where we show that autocorrelation, cross-correlation, post-trade ratio, COAR and COAC all have gone up, and even at a higher pace, looking at, at the uh, interaction term here, they are all positive and much bigger than, than the, the raw numbers. There. So the effect of arrowhead has increased, uh, is, is, is effect of arrowhead is, is increased in systemic risk, but it is even more critical during the extreme market condition. So, so if market is not doing so well, that could quickly spill over in the entire system, and, and the entire system can be pulled down. All right, so we do several robustness tests, but just to save time, I'm going to skip and get to my concluding slide. Um, the things that we find in the paper, we, obviously we analyze the low latency, um, effect of low latency in the market quality. We see how the launch of Arrowhead, which basically uh, launched the high frequency trading on, on Tokyo Stock Exchange, affect the market quality of Tokyo stock market. We saw that um, volatility and liquidity, it's a positive for them because liquidity has increased, volatility has declined. We also show that number of trades have increased, which again could be a good thing. But um, post to trade ratio has increased as well. So maybe there are orders that are with, without intention to trade, those are being posted. Could be for several reasons. Could be to slow down other traders, could be to, for price manipulation and so forth. That has increased significantly in the post arrowhead environment. Autocorrelation, cross-correlation, again, the measure of shock propagation risk, how, how quickly a shock is being propagated within the stock and across stock have increased significantly. Similarly, the systemic risk measures, COAR and COAC, have increased significantly. So those are the bad things. So overall, the risk has increased, but liquidity and volatility, um, uh, that's good for the market.
and we show that, well, the risks are, have increased even at a higher pace during the tail, tail events. So that's it. Thank you very much. So we are lucky that we're going to have uh, um, the formal discussion by Nidhi, who has done, who's looked at this from an academic perspective. And we're going to have also informal discussions later on from Farid, who is from GetCo, who is probably causing all of these results. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Venki, and thanks, Pavan, for the great presentation. So uh, what, how I'll go about this presentation is very briefly summarize the paper, I understood it, and then go on to the comments, questions, and suggestions that I have. So what the paper is attempting to do is basically examine how latency improvement at the exchanges end affected two parameters, two market parameters. One was liquidity, and second, more importantly, is the systemic microstructure risk. And the uh, hypothesis is that latency uh, improvement at the Tokyo Stock Exchange would have induced high-frequency trading. And the question really is that uh, because of the surge in high-frequency trading that is expected out of uh, uh, la latency improvement, how did it affect the market? Did it improve the liquidity supply in the markets? which would have been good. And second is, uh, has that made the markets more fragile? I think, as Pawan said, the first part of it uh, has mostly been answered and addressed well in the literature. And on the whole, uh, most of the papers do find that liquidity improves after algorithmic traders or high-frequency traders come to the market. But I think where this paper really stands out is in terms of uh, it addressing the systemic risk component of it, which is uh, not really uh, addressed that well in the literature so far. And, uh, Primarily because I believe is the difficulty to measure systemic risk in this context. context. And therefore, I think this paper has been quite innovative in terms of introducing these measures. So how do, they, how do they ascertain this is they exploit an exogenous event, that is the introduction of the high-speed trading platform, the Arrowhead, by the Tokyo Stock Exchange. They do a pre- and post-analysis before Arrowhead and after Arrowhead for a set of 150 stocks. And what they find is that while liquidity improved for a majority of the sample stocks, there was a corresponding increase in the systemic microstructure risk as well. And if this finding is to be believed, then of course it has got severe implications from a policy perspective. Now I'll come to the uh, questions or uh, maybe some comments that I have regarding this. So the paper says that the introduction of Arrowhead induced high level of HFT into the market. And my question is, what is the degree of HFT at, uh, uh, at TSE for the sample of the stocks that has been used? And so at one point of time, I mean, you mentioned that in the presentation as well, that after Arrowhead, uh, HFT increased from 0 to 36%. But there is no mention of in the paper as to how you are capturing that, whether that has been picked up from some source or that has been measured uh, uh, ex explicitly in your paper. That, uh, I mean, I think uh, it will be good to clarify that. And if uh, you have not already done that, and I was wondering if it can be, if the available proxies that are there, indirect proxies to capture HFTNS in the markets, can that be used? Uh, or not. The second question is if you actually capture the level of algorithmic trading using uh, the indirect proxies that are available, do you see a large cross-sectional variation in the degree of HFT in the sample stocks or not? The reason I'm saying this is that if you, if yes, if that's the case, then uh, can you find out stocks which have got high HFT versus low HFT? after the arrowhead introduction. And uh, maybe if those stocks can be matched on similar characteristics, then you can perhaps do a different dif difference in difference kind of analysis, which would make the entire exercise much more robust than a simple panel regression that we are generally used to in the standard econometrics. That will just lend extraordinary support to the entire hypothesis that you are saying. Uh, in terms of the measures used, uh, as you said, so the, uh, they're using COVAR and COVAC. These are the two measures that have been borrowed from the systemic risk literature. But I was not clear about how is the tail risk being captured. So uh, usually the way they go about uh, in the systemic risk is use some quantile regression and find out when the firm is in distress, how other firms might get affected. So from, the re from my reading of the paper, I was not clear how is that tail risk get, uh, getting captured. The second thing is regarding the shock propagation risk and do measures, autocorrelation and cross-correlation in order flow are used. And my question is, uh, I mean, it was not clarified in the paper. So is the cross-correlation 
being measured between the security and the market index or all of the securities that are in the sample or all of the securities that are listed. So that's a clarificatory question that I have. Besides, I would also refer you to this paper by Boomer and Shankar, uh, who examine uh, commonality in the order flow after the introduction of co-location at NSC. And their premise is also the same. How has algorithmic trading affected the commonality in order flow? Has that resulted in, in an increased level of uh, commonality or not? And what they find is that it actually reduced, which is contrary to what you find. So it might be useful for you to uh, go take a look at that paper. Besides, regarding the codes to trades ratio that has been used to capture code stuffing risk, I'm not sure. So basically, high codes to trades ratio is a typical feature of high frequency trading. And uh, I was not uh, particularly convinced uh, if it really captures the code stuffing risk or not. So uh, uh, the idea is that in case of code stuffing, your uh, codes are getting updated at a very short interval of time. But if you just capture it plainly by codes to trades ratio, you do not know whether that was over a smaller interval or a larger interval. And uh, with respect to this, I have an alternative to suggest. I'm not sure if you have the data or not. But maybe uh, you can use the codes to rate ratio as a fraction of average time to mo modification. So suppose, uh, in general, your codes to rate ratio on an order was 10. And your codes are getting uh, average time between modifications on that order was, suppose, uh, 1 millisecond. So if you take a, a ratio of these two, it becomes 10. Basically, that will indicate the uh, pressure that it is putting on the bandwidth versus an order, which has also got an code to trade ratio of 10 only. But uh, uh, the orders, the average time between modifications was, say, uh, 100 milliseconds, in which case your, uh, the uh, pr pressure it is putting on the bandwidth, that particular order will be lower. So for that, you will need data on code updates, specific data. And I'm not sure if that is available to you or not. With regard to the econometric approach that you're using, so the paper uses three periods, June 2008, January 2009, January 2011, to analyze the impact. So uh, you mentioned that co-location was introduced in November 2008 and Arrowhead in January 2010. So my first question is that do we not expect any impact of co-location uh, uh, in January 2009, and it is quite probable that it was it did not impact because the latency uh, was so high in the market. So if you could just clarify on that as well. And second thing is if uh, if uh, they, if you do not uh, expect any impact of co-location, then perhaps you should do a regression analysis for June 2008 and Ju January 2009 as well, and use the same set of measures. And ideally, they should uh, shouldn't have shown any change. They won't show any change if your regression is capturing all the possible uh, 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 effects that it should capture. My next comment is uh, uh, about the market volatility, a control for market volatility in the regression. So you have got a control for stock volatility and market returns. But because January 2009 and January 2011 were so different periods in terms of market fall, I think it will be useful to just add that as well instead of just a stock specific factor. You also mentioned in the paper about the details of some uh, high speed and low speed dummy that you're using in the uh, regression. I was not clear as to what that is capturing and what is the data underlying that. Besides, finally, you have also mentioned about the use of intraday seasonality dummy in uh, your uh, robustness check. But I think that should go as the prime uh, regression model because you're doing one minute analysis and intraday seasonality is bound to come. So that might be useful. Thank you. Thank you, Nidhi. Um, I'll just l let the audience also ask you questions, and then we can you can answer. Yeah. So, quick question, actually. So, so yeah. hi, I'm Abhinav. I'm from Liverpool. My area is basically corporate finance, so it's pretty new to me. Might be a stupid question, that's why. <laughs> but so you use 150 stocks, 50 from large cap, mid cap, and small cap. So do you do a separate analysis for these three? Because it might be the case that the results are being just driven by a particular se section of stocks. Right. So what we do is we do stock by stock analysis. All our regressions are stock by stock. So, so all our regressions are just run for one stock at a time. No, no, but like, do you report the results or do you interpret the results like, okay, you're doing stock by stock, but fifth, and then the results are an aggregate for one fifth. No, right? no, no. We report them separately too, like for large, mid, okay. and small cap. Yeah. Right. So the, the so when the you results are different for small cap, 
the small cap stocks are very less affected versus large cap stocks are very highly affected. Okay, so that's yeah. pretty expected then. Um, yeah, in some sense you can argue that because these high frequency traders are attracted to more established stocks because they are more liquid. They can quickly, because they go zero at the end of the day. So if they're stuck in smaller stocks, they probably may not be able to offload it at the end of the day. So, yeah, so any, any other questions from the floor? Yeah, from it. Uh, I guess. Um, uh, hi, I'm Raman, uh, FRG, IG, IDR. Uh, I'm coming entirely from a practitioner's point of view. And, uh, you know, the fear that ALGOS had or HFT had, you know, maybe two or three years ago, I was just thinking that it's, it's something when the entire market upgrades and starts doing HFT, then, you know, the sort of uh, fears and, and the hidden ghosts of HFT then sort of start disappearing. So, you know, we have seen, and this is really from my experience at SEVI, that uh, the regulators around the world were very worried about HFT and, you know, such fears have started, you know, sort of subsiding because the entire market, especially, you know, the uh, equity derivatives market is largely HFT driven even at the NSE. So, you know, would such, uh, you know, deep studies on HFT really sort of uh, continue in the future is really the question that I was asking. And, uh, you know, some of the fears, especially on court um, stuffing, I think it's a bit of an exaggerated fear because, you know, when a guy does court stuffing, he actually runs the risk of those orders going into trade if he is actually very close to where the market is trading. So, you know, court stuffing is typically done, you know, away from, from the price because you do not want to, you know, sort of put your money into the market. So, you know, the market has its ability to uh, understand when court stuffing is happening and there are, you know, different parameters which you would read before, uh, you know, putting your own genuine order in. So, whether, you know, literature has, you know, uh, identified such, uh, you know, sort of um, activities as not so important. All right. Um, Susan, your question. Pavan, I have a, a very quick question. Uh, you know, uh, typically when these studies show that we are doing uh, measures of market quality changes and we use a lot of measures, some of these measures are not um, consistent with each other. So liquidity improves, risk uh, has worsened, systemic risk has worsened, even the volatility might have improved. Uh, how do we get a sense of the measure of the costs and benefits of each? And I think that's where the policymaker really gets confused. So we see that an event that happens in a, in a tail risk situation, which is a very, very low probability of occurrence, does happen and it has worsened. Whereas systematically across the day, day on day, millisecond after millisecond, liquidity has improved. So that implies a benefit and there is a cost. Is it possible, and I'm not sure this is possible, right, but is it possible to get a sense of the balance? What is the cost that we are paying for the kind of benefits that we're getting? If we can put that down, and I think we should be able to because you've got all the data, that would be a real value addition to this entire debate and I suspect to the paper as well. All right, I think um, just following up on this, um, I think a lot of regulators are focused on the tail risk events. And even though I think systematically most studies have said HFTs have improved market quality, but the regulators still want to slow them down. And I think largely because they put much more value. Um, there was somebody else on that side. Yeah. Sorry. In uh, As I recollect, I think in Japan there's a lot of seasonality in uh, stocks that is month-to-month -month seasonality. And I see that you've taken January as your period, possibly because of uh, uh, the timing in which Arrowhead was released. But uh, if, you know, if the study can be extended to other months, it could help. The second thing is Michael Levis's book uh, points out to the fact that uh, the get goes of the world, their trading has been almost flawless. So any such statistics uh, uh, st stat on Japan market, I mean, uh, what has been the experience of the HFT guys, uh, if they are published, it would be helpful. Um, you were talking about uh, auto correlation, uh, that is correlation between orders, right? I was just wondering whether that is just a case of the orders in trades becoming smaller now than uh, compared to what it was before Arrowhead. That is uh, because 
uh, the sizes have become smaller so obviously uh, buy orders will follow buy orders and sell orders will follow sell orders is, does does it mean anything more in terms of overall risk or movements in the market um i have two points to add and i'm, I'm very surprised that far does not jumped in yet um one is um, there are many types of traders who use uh, algorithmic trading right there is a whole lot of execution based algos um, where people are trading, like for example, a typical large buy side firm would put in a huge portfolio of trades together and then they do a VWAP or some sort of a schedule based algorithm. So that might be one reason why you're seeing commonality go up um, because they're sort of doing a basket based trading and it's much easier to trade it if it is electronic. Um, then the other thing I wanted to ask you is um, I think your example earlier about the order book uh, showing the differences between the two stocks might be too naive because you have these iceberg orders, right? So you, you could, like the displayed liquidity is not the only liquidity out there. So there could be a, an endogenous reason why in some stocks people are willing to disclose more. And, and so you should probably the best impact, the impact measure is probably a better metric than just seeing the book plain book information. And then there's one on price limits. I think in Japan there's also a lot of price limits. Um, and I think that puts a spoke on algo trading per se. So you should see a lot of uh, orders slowing down as, as the prices get closer to the limits. So that could be one reason why the volatility has not changed. Because there's an exogenous market structure that is preventing volatility from going out of hand. So left to themselves. Uh, so that, I think that's uh, some of the questions. And you, anything to add or based on your experience? <laughs> uh, no, it, it's it's actually been a very good discussion. I've actually learned a lot from it. Uh, uh, it's been good. I just point out a couple of things. Um, uh, let's stay first with the Tokyo market. So Tokyo market is not a single market, even if 90% of the market trades on one venue. In, uh, in the Japanese stock exchanges, even if we consider Osaka and Tokyo as one, calling it the Japan exchange, JPX, you have two additional PTSs and by last count, 28 dark poles. The influence of those on the primary market are substantial, even if a lot of the trading gets done uh, in that uh, market. Uh, I think it, interesting conversation was, uh, uh, mm, or uh, rather interesting points were made regarding if the quote to trade ratio goes up, I believe it is naive uh, and unfair to say that you're either doing price manipulation or you're doing uh, quote stuffing. I think there are plenty of other reasons to do that. Um, and I just point out two of them. First of all, the cost of putting a quote in the market keeps going down, and that is the best way of going after price discovery. Let's kind of think about a few years back when you wanted to figure out how to trade, you would pick up the phone, call your broker, you would have to discuss the activities of last weekend, how the kids are doing in school, and what you're going to do next weekend. It was a fairly expensive process to get an order or a quote in the market. Then Chuck Schwab came along and said, here's a modem, find out this way. Well, you would have to dial with a 9600 baud modem and hook up and your line would drop three times, but finally you would find out where something is trading. Today, it's just a much easier process. And just because that is the case, it isn't to say that when Schwab allowed us to do it 100 times faster than a phone, people were either price manipulating or stuffing the market. And by the same token, I think just the fact that people are taking the temperature of the market more often because it is a much easier and cheaper process, we should not think that the reasons could only be nefarious. There's another reason for that too, and that is that the markets are much more global now. And in order to gauge where markets are with respect to one another, people constantly inquire. You no longer trade in a vacuum. You don't trade a single stock you traded a stock within its, and the gentleman who said don't use the word ecosystem is probably not around, so I use the word ecosystem. You have to do it with respect to its ecosystem, and also you, there is 
a much bigger and bigger levels of aggregation. The national markets, regional markets, global markets, all of those come into play. You can't do the same thing by picking up the phone, chatting up your broker and figuring out what's going on all over the world simultaneously. There's a lot of information that needs to flow, be processed, be handled, and then re-enter the market. So that's the question there. Uh, the point was made by the young lady um, about uh, the commonality. I believe the study by uh, Shankar and uh, Eckhart uh, Bomer is a very good study. I've seen that in its different stages of evolution multiple times. I think they've done an exceptional piece of work there. That should be a good read for you. Uh, and uh, finally, what was the, there was another point, I guess, that, oh, oh and as far as the uh, autocorrelation, uh, the point about autocorrelation is actually a very interesting one. Um, certainly you would see events ripple through the markets faster simply because the technology is there to allow it. It isn't that, it isn't that it's a new phenomenon that people have just discovered. People have always wanted to do it, except you didn't have the means to do it. Now you have the means to do it. It is not just a, an aspect of low latency. It's just something that as technology allows you to do it, you want to act faster. If you could, I remember in the old days, uh, obviously, if you could go and pick up your copy of Wall Street Journal or Barron's at the corner newsstand, you wouldn't wait and say, well, I'll pick it up in the afternoon. You will pick it up first thing in the morning, right? If you think about the very first kind of high-speed networks created in the United States had nothing to do with modern inventions, right? When New York and Philadelphia used to trade using flags, semaphores, there are actually people placed between New York and Philadelphia to pass information as rapidly as possible using, you know, semaphores. So the desire has always been there. And the fact that now technology makes it possible just allows everybody to take advantage of it. Uh, fast or uh, not so fast. So everybody is sort of uh, uh, doing that. So in that sense, I would say uh, the speed of propagation is one thing. And because of that, depending on the time frame over which you would study your autocorrelation, you would actually probably see greater autocorrelation. But it's, it would be interesting to see how sustained that is and compare that to previous years. You will realize that actually those bursts of information, because they propagate faster, do not last as long. If they did, people would be very, very rich. Uh, so that is the, the fact that trading is actually much more challenging now tells you that that does not happen. So all those short-term bursts, of course, information is going to propagate much faster. It is not as sustained over time. So if you extend the horizon over which this takes place, you will see a completely different result. And actually, you see the footprint of that in the fact that you know, volatility is very, very low by historical standards. That's my final point, by the way, is that if, in fact, we go to the first paper of the day, if volatility or implied volatility is an expectation of things going drastically wrong, well, I guess not too many people seem to be worried about it. Thank you, Farid. Sure. Um, you got lots of points. Maybe you want to address one or two of the main ones. Well, thank you again for all your comments, and thank you for discussing the paper. I really appreciate all the comments. And um, exactly, I mean, whatever you said is, 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 is true. For, I can respond to some of them. Obviously, there are lots, and I'll, I'll be available after we are done with the session to answer any questions you may have. Um, starting off by, uh, let's say, uh, intraday seasonality, obviously we can incorporate that, uh, high speed, uh, let's see, usual. <laughs> uh, number of studies in future, um, the problem with these high frequency trading studies is the data sets are getting bigger and bigger. So I'm using, I have access to a supercomputer and one regression in my analysis takes about 14 days. And so it's a, it's a lot of effort to come up with just, just simple results with this um, huge amount of data. Okay, and, and now the NASDAQ data is not really well. So the, the each data that we recently got, it's, it's in bits. And so we have to write even more um, like computer codes to, to be able to read that data, just, just reading that data. One day of data is about 60 gigabytes. And so analyzing like a month of data, that's huge, uh, several terabytes. 
So I, I'm sure there will be more studies coming up, and there are. There are lots of working papers on high frequency trading. People are trying to um, do subsampling and try to do that. So I, I don't, I, I, I'm sure that there will be more studies coming in. Cost and benefit analysis of each measure, I can consider ex excellent point, I guess, because there are good things and there are bad things. So which one is, uh, is sort of taking over the other, which would be interesting to note. But again, the goal here is, I mean, if we consider them as, as one or, or they are separate, and, and when does, depending on the market condition too, the benefit may sometimes be, benefits really, uh, we care about them, but other times, like during the tail events, we really don't, we are more worried about the risk at that time because the entire, again, that's, that's my, uh, that's my Put thought. a number on it. Show me a net effect. Well, like flash crash, let's say. Yeah, but the question is, is it justified? Is the hysteria justified? I'm not so convinced. <laughs> uh, Can I just say something since you've used the term flash crash uh -huh. uh, quite a few times? You could also consider a flash crash happened after the rise of algorithmic and electronic trading. Crash of 87 happened before those. And I would highly recommend to folks to compare those two. You may consider the fact that flash crash may have actually been a much... Uh, uh, less serious event uh, than what the crash of 87 was precisely because of some of the things that were available to us during that period. It lasted 20 minutes, not two and a half days, and the market virtually recovered within those 20 minutes. In the previous case, it took us two years to recover the market. So before we throw this term flash crash around, consider that it was a flash crash by flash recovery in 19 minutes. It is pretty naive to just take the first half of it and not consider the second half of it. I, I want to leave this as the last word. Flash recovery is a nice way to stop it. We've got a few more algo papers coming up, so you have more chances to discuss about this.